Windows PowerShell refers to errors as exceptions. The word is exception is something that comes from the Microsoft.NET framework. And remember, PowerShell is built on the framework, so sometimes we, we have to use the words that come with the framework. So instead of error, we're going to say exception. Well, not really. We'll still say error because that's what it is, but think exception in the back of your head. So these occur whenever something in PowerShell goes wrong. Maybe you tried to divide something by zero, or maybe you tried to connect to WMI on a remote computer and it was firewalled, or you didn't have permission, or something else prevented the connection from working. Maybe the computer was turned off. Now, some exceptions force PowerShell to stop what it's doing. These are called terminating exceptions. Other exceptions aren't so bad. Maybe they're just like a hiccup, and PowerShell is able to try and continue what it was doing. The difference between terminating and non-terminating exceptions is a big deal when it comes to trapping those errors and dealing with them yourself rather than just allowing PowerShell to display an error message on the screen. Let's just quickly see what an exception looks like. Here's a call to get WMI object, retrieving a WMI object from a remote computer which doesn't exist. This command takes a moment to time out, and when it does, it produces an error message. Uh, in PowerShell terms, an exception. Now this particular exception happens to be a terminating one for this command, meaning the command can't continue doing anything else. But it's a non-terminating error in every other respect. If this had been in a script, the script would have continued executing even though this command failed. So we're going to start with a variable, a built-in variable called error action preference. This tells PowerShell what to do with errors. Now the default is continue. You actually would just set dollar sign error action preference equal continue. So the default is continue. And that tells PowerShell to display the error and if possible to continue processing. That's for non-terminating errors. Silently continue suppresses the error message. So even if the error occurs, you won't see the error message. Now that may sound like a good idea. You might think, great, no news is good news. If an error happens, just don't show it to me. Yeah, but the problem is whatever script you write isn't really going to be working correctly. For the most part, you want to see errors because they tell you what's going wrong. The only time you want to suppress an error is if you are anticipating it as something that could happen and you're dealing with it on your own. So another choice is stop, and that means display the error and stop. It basically turns the error into a terminating, terminating exception. The fourth option is inquire, and you're never really going to use this. It just tells PowerShell, um, you know, if an error happens, ask me what to do. And you don't want your scripts stopping every single time and, and asking, should I continue, should I silently continue, or should I stop? So you're usually going to pick one of the first three and not use inquire. So error action preference sets the error behavior for the current scope, and that applies to all commands that run within that scope. So if you change error action preference at the shell level, right in the global interactive shell, then you're changing it for everything. If you change it within a script, then you're only changing it within that script. If you set it within a function, then you're only changing it within that function. So what you're doing with error action preference is setting the default. Next, you've got the error action parameter that comes with every single commandlet that runs in PowerShell. Now you could just type dash error action. However, the folks who made PowerShell made a convenient alias for it. So you can just type dash EA, which is a lot shorter. It stands for error action. All commandlets accept this error action parameter. And it overrides the default error action preference for the current commandlet. And it has the same options as error action preference. Continue, silently continue, stop, and inquire. So what you do is you set error action preference to whatever you want the default for your current scope to be. And if you need a particular commandlet to do something different, then you use its error action parameter. Now, most terminating errors will only terminate the current commandlet. The entire script can still keep running. Get WMI object is a fantastic example of this. If you've got a script that's doing a bunch of stuff and right in the middle, it calls get WMI object and that get WMI object fails because maybe the remote computer's turned off, then the commandlet will fail, but the entire script can still keep running. However, 
If you add dash EA stop, that's the error action parameter, setting it to stop, or if you set error action preference equal to stop, that causes the error, which normally was only making that one command let explode, to become a terminating error for the entire scope. So essentially, you're stopping the entire script from running at that point. Now, that might seem like a crazy idea, but you're going to see why it's useful in just a second. For the next few examples, I'm going to use a script so that you can clearly see whether or not an error is fatal to the script or whether the script can continue after the error. For each of these, I'm going to be using the getContent commandlet to retrieve the contents of a file, but this file name doesn't exist. I'll start by setting the error action preference variable to continue. That's the default anyway. Finally, the script will contain one additional command so that we can see whether or not it executes. Now, if we run this, we can see that the error does occur and the second command does execute. So this was a non-terminating error in terms of the script. Let's add the dash EA parameter to the command and specify silently continue. Running again, we see that the error is suppressed. The dash EA parameter overrides the error action preference for that particular command. All right, let's set EA to stop. When we run it this time, we see that the command's error has been turned into a terminating error. The second command never executed. That's basically what the stop error action does, converts any error into a terminating exception. Now, I want to make one more point. Let's change the command's error action to continue again. This time, I'm going to go to the shell to execute this. I'll tell the shell to execute the script and afterwards to execute a second command. Running this, I can see that the second command did execute, even though the error occurred in the script, and that's exactly what continue should do. Back in the script, I'll change that EA to stop. Back in the shell, I'll run that again. Notice this time that the exception has stopped everything from running. The exception was passed back to the calling scope, which is the shell, and it has acted as a terminating error at that point. The second command in my script never executed because the script exited when the error occurred, passing control back to the shell, which called the script. You'll need to remember your scope rules and how each scope is the child of another because exceptions play into that structure. Now, when a terminating error occurs, one that was thrown with EA stop or by setting error action preference to stop, you can trap that error. That allows your code to execute in response to the error, so you get to decide what to do about the error. You also get to decide if the error is going to stay in the current scope, in other words, if you can deal with it and allow the current scope to continue executing, or you can decide if you want to push the error up to the parent scope because you can't deal with it, or because that's how you've architected your script. So to build the trap, you're going to declare it with the trap keyword, with like most constructs in Windows PowerShell. That's going to go inside curly braces. Inside those curly braces, you do whatever you need to do to deal with the trap. That goes inside the trap. Now you do have to remember, the trap itself must be defined before the error might occur. In other words, when PowerShell is reading through your script, it needs to see the trap before an error occurs. That way, when an error occurs, PowerShell remembers where the trap was and it can go look for it. You're going to use error zero to access the last error that occurred so you can see what it was and see what you might want to do with it. At the end of the trap, after you've executed all the code you want to execute, you've got two choices. The first choice is break. This exits the current trap and passes the error off to the calling scope. So if the error occurred within a function, you're going to be exiting the function and going up to whatever script or function contained it. Option two is continue. This keyword causes execution to pick back up again on whatever line follows the error in the same scope as the trap itself. And you're going to see some examples of how all this fits together, so just bear with me. However, you need to be really careful with this stuff. You got to understand the, the chain of scopes, right? You've got scripts that live within the global scope. You've got functions that live inside there. They can have functions inside. So you need to understand how errors are passed up these things. It requires you to pay very close attention. And I really recommend that you just walk through the entire chain. You really have to sit down, almost print out your script. Okay, if an error occurs here, this trap is going to execute, and if I use continue, 
then I'm in this scope. So it's this line that executes. I'm going to show you an example of how to sort of walk through that. Here's a short script with a trap statement. Again, I've included a simple command that I know will generate an error, and I've included a command after that. I've set the EA to stop on the command that I expect to have an error. I need to do that in order to trap the error. Only terminating exceptions can be trapped. So let's run this and see what happens. I want to run this in the shell again so that I can append a second command to run after the script runs. The result is that the error occurs, the trap executes, and then the error is displayed. Notice that the default action was to continue with the next line of code in the same scope. So the second command in the script also ran. Continuing was the default because of the setting of error action preference. The second shell command also executes. And this is almost what we want. But if we're trapping an error, we probably don't want to see the error displayed. So back in the script, I'll set the error action preference variable to silently continue. Back to the shell, we'll run this again. Same results as last time, only the error wasn't displayed because it was suppressed at the script level. Now let's specify the continue keyword at the end of the trap and change the error action preference back to continue. Back in the shell, I'll execute this again. This time I don't see the error because the trap exited with continue, so there was no error left to display. So let's try something different. We'll change the trap's exit action to break instead. Now I run this in the shell and get very different results. I see that the trap executed, but that was it. The exception was passed to the calling scope, which is the shell in this case, exiting the script scope. This terminating exception stopped anything further from occurring, as we can see by the fact that no further output is displayed. Let's change the script's error action preference to stop and remove the break command from the trap. And what will happen now? When I run this, the trap executes. We can see that from the output. But the default is to now break or stop running because that's how error action preference is set. If I put continue back into the trap, go back into the shell and run the script again, you'll see that the continue keyword caused execution to remain within the original scope. The error is never passed to the calling scope. All of these interactions can definitely be confusing, so it pays to experiment and test thoroughly. Now you're always going to use dollar sign error zero in square brackets to access the last error that occurred. However, all commandlets also support a parameter called dash error variable, which is aliased as dash ev. That allows you to specify your own variable and any errors that occur to that commandlet get written into the variable you specify. You can use ev in addition to ea and that way if an error occurs and a trap runs, you know exactly what variable that lives in. Here's a simple example of a command that will cause an error. Notice that I've set this script's error action preference to silently continue to suppress any error messages. I've added the ev parameter to the command and given it a variable name. Notice that I do not use the dollar sign here and it'll store the error in that variable. After the command runs, I'm using an if construct to test the error variable's count property to see if an error occurred or not. If one did, I'll display some information about that error. Running this, I can see exactly what occurred. PowerShell didn't automatically display error information. I did. All of this will hopefully make more sense in a practical example. All right, here are my tips to some practical, real-world error handling. First of all, try to trap errors in the same scope in which they occur. Yeah, that kind of requires you to think ahead a little bit and look at what a script or a function is doing and think of the ways in which it might blow up and try to trap those. But the idea is to, to keep these things self-contained as much as possible. So what you might do, for example, is have a function that's supposed to do something and return a value. If an error occurs, you trap that error within the function and return some kind of sensible value instead of just an error. That way, no matter what happens inside the function, something sensible and reasonable is coming out of it. For example, if you, you have a function that's using WMI to retrieve, I don't know, a service pack version from a computer. If all goes well, the function returns a service pack number. If an error occurs, maybe because the computer is not reachable, the function might trap the error 
And instead of returning service pack number, or instead of returning an error, it just returns a value like not reachable. That way the function isn't blowing up really, it's dealing with its own issues internally. Here's a practical example of error handling in action. The script starts by clearing the contents of a file named exceptions.txt. I'm just doing this so I get a clean file to start with each time. Then I'm retrieving the contents of computers.txt, which lists one computer name per line. I'm using a for each loop to go through each computer one at a time. For each computer, I'm attempting to use WMI to retrieve that computer's operating system information. Notice that I've set the error action parameter to silently continue and the error variable parameter to error. After the command executes, I'm checking the count property of the error variable. If it's zero, then I know that no error occurred. So I output the computer name and its operating system build number. If error is not zero, then an error occurred. I write this computer's name to the exceptions file and display an error message. Then I clear the error object so that I can start fresh with the next computer. Running this in the shell, you can see that the results are correct. Reachable computers display their build numbers, while unreachable ones display an error. If I examine the contents of exceptions.txt, you can see that it contains the computer names which failed.